This video was recorded in front of a live virtual audience. Hi everybody, Jacob here. Welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be reviewing Chanel number 22, the Eau de Parfum. I have the 75 mil size here with me. Batch code 3501 couple of years old already it's turning color very nicely turning slightly orangey really good really delicious color the darker it turns the more the vanilla ripens in there yes this one does have vanilla in it before we get to the spritzing the spraying the sniffing and the snuffing uh, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already here on youtube you can also push the join button next to the subscription button become a member today and gain access to extra perks. You can also join me on Patreon, Super Day Cub, all spelled together over on Patreon as well. Also gain access to extra perks there too. Thank you to all my patrons and members who have already pledged. Without you, the Fashion Bunker wouldn't be here. Or the Perfume Vault wouldn't be here either, as we are now in the Perfume Vault. What else to say? This video is being filmed live in front of a virtual audience. If you want to partake in the filming as well, be reminded that I film live every Saturday and uh, you can check out my community tab on my YouTube channel every Friday towards like late Friday. That's when I post usually when the actual schedule is going to happen for Saturday and then you get to see your local streaming times. And then you could set a reminder and be a part of the conversation. So I do have my live co-reviewers and chatters in the sidebar as we speak. So you're going to co-review with me. So guys, let's spritz away. I got number 22 for y'alls on both sides. Hmm. Very Chanel. Very Chanel. Number 22 was released in 1922. The nose behind it is Ernest Beau. However, Ernest Beau did not release the Eau de Parfum concentration. Ernest Beau released the Pure Perfume and the Eau de Toilette and then the Cologne, which kind of came and went. We're not so sure if Henri Robert had his kind of fingers placed in the Cologne and formulating the Cologne. But just to be safe, let's just say the Pure Perfume, which is here. Number 22, the Pure Perfume, which is empty because I have decanted it here because... I do like to spray my number 22. So I do, I have the whole bottle decanted in the sprayer. So I got number 22, the Pure Perfume. And then we got the Eau de Toilette, which was available for purchase, then was discontinued, then was brought back again. So at a certain point in the 80s, all across the United States, you could get the entire bath and body range of Chanel number 22 in the Eau de Toilette and Cologne form. This is an example, a rare example, it's no longer in production, of the refillable Eau de Toilette. They used to have the black container with gold metal for number five, but number 22 has the white one. This is how you would refill it. And this is the juice inside. This is a 50 mil. That's all they had available back then, 50 mil. And um, unfortunately, you know, the last couple of droplets left of this little gorgeous beauty that is also um, drenched in incense. Incense, which is missing in the Eau de Parfum, but we're going to get to that. So then the 22 was taken off the market, brought back again. Bottles revamped, changed, reformulated. But yeah, even bottles get reformulated, redesigned, and then ultimately re-released in 200 ml form as an Eau de Toilette. This one is really maturing very well. Look at that juice turning almost brown gold. This thing is amazing. Mm, so intense and deep. And then in 2016, the Eau de Toilette was completely taken off the market for the sake of the more expensive Eau de Parfum, which is different than the Eau de Toilette, you know, and then the pure perfume. I mean, if you love your Eau de Toilette and you love your Cologne, which is a bit more raw. And if you love your uh, pure perfume of number 22, you're going to be a little bit disappointed by the Eau de Parfum initially, initially, when you first start wearing it, because the Eau de Parfum has a softer nuance to it. It kind of makes number 22 even more approachable than it already was. And number 22 has already been deemed 
by many Chanel lovers and by Chanel itself, you know, they've promoted it many a time throughout history as the wedding fragrance, the fragrance to wear for your wedding, that special occasion that makes you feel giving and taking everything, you know, because number 22, as I say often in my videos, is the most giving of Chanel perfumes. By that I mean Chanel perfumes usually have a detached coolness about them, especially if you if you observe number 19. It's austere. I mean, as beautiful as it is, it still has, it's sealed within itself. It's very compact. And a lot of those sparkly aldehydes that we have in a lot of Chanel perfumes, they kind of play a game and they trickle down towards the base notes of the fragrance, delivering a sort of a combination that makes you feel that the smell of the fragrance is slightly elusive, slightly arrogant as well. It has an arrogance to it. Every Chanel perfume has a, a bit of a... Fine, you can wear me, but... I do what I want to do, and... Uh, I'm just passing by on, you know, personal perfumes do have that character, very strong character. Number 22 also has the aldehydes in the opening, and they are bombastic and sparkly like diamonds, but they are floral diamonds. They feel like diamonds that, ref that refract light, mostly in the sunshine yellow spectrum. A lot of Chanel aldehydes are like sparkling diamonds that refract light and kind of cast more the part of the rainbow that is uh, towards the purpley hue, the purpley greeny hue, but number 22 refracts the light and casts that gorgeous yellow sunshine. So that's how the aldehyde works in number 22. The Eau de Parfum has uh, an intensity, an amped intensity of aldehydes, amped intensity of vanilla, and amped intensity of that powdery, irisy touch or tone, which actually, in this case, is the tuberose. <laughs> and yes, number 22 is also all about the tuberose. So let's get to the notes. So, the Eau de Parfum, which was released in 2016, was reformulated, or so they tell us, by Olivier Polge, the son of Jacques Polge. Jacques Polge, who reformulated and re-edited the Eau de Toilette form. Uh, formulation of number 22. So the Eau de Toilette of number 22 is the father, Jacques, and we got the son, Olivier, reformulating, or actually releasing for the first time in Chanel history, the Eau de Parfum of Chanel number 22. Softening it up, adding that vanilla, we got the aldehydes, Lily of the Valley and Neroli in the top notes, middle notes, we got tuberose, ylang ylang, jasmine and rose. Then we got vanilla and vetiver in the base notes, a very streamlined and simple and basic. Um, listing of ingredients. However, there are way more ingredients in here. There are more flowers in here. They always say that number 22 is the smaller sister of Chanel number 5. Chanel number 5 being more elusive, more abstract. Chanel number 5 being more of a non-graspable fragrance as Coco wanted it to resemble nothing that you could grasp. In the 20s, perfumes usually smelled of particular flowers, particular formulations that had a very specific stamp on them. This smelled of that flower, this smelled of jasmine, that smelled of rose, this smelled, you know, this or that, cypress, blah, 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 blah. And then, number five comes to the world with, with its initial over 183 ingredients, 186 ingredients release, and then they were toned down to 86, and then toned down more and more and more with time, but... It was it was a, it was a bomb of non you couldn't understand what what is really in it. It was the quintessential Art Deco slash Bauhaus type of um, Art Nouveau type of fragrance. It crystalline in its aldehydic beauty. It was the initiation of aldehydes. It was the first aldehydes ever produced. Super expensive back then. Now super cheap to make. But imagine having something smelling of crystals and diamonds, but in an abstract form. That was number five. And then it is also said that Ernest Beau, coming from Russia, military, this and that, wanted to deliver a smell of the winter, of the cold snow and Russian winter and freezing. And yes, Chanel number no. five does have that cold touch, but it's, it's so elusive that uh, it also has a warming aspect to it. So that's why kind of I prefer to wear it a lot in wintertime, um, especially the pure perfume. Even though it smells of cold in a way, there is a 
frostiness in channel number five, that kind of detachment, which I say when I talk about aldehydes of channel fragrances usually refract those crystals, those diamonds refracting light uh, in its colder spectrums, right? That's Chanel number no. five too. Even though there's a powdery warmth in it, it's a very lucid perfume. So number 22 is simpler than Chanel number no. five in the beginning. And so a lot of people kind of just coined the term of number 22 being the smaller sister of number five. But in reality, is it the smaller sister of number five? Yes, in terms of popularity, for sure it is. It is the unlucky smaller sister of Chanel number five because it has been secluded within the Les Exclusives uh, range and you cannot buy it anywhere else but at um, directly at Chanel boutiques on the Chanel website and in some select Chanel counters, bigger Chanel counters within department stores that also carry the Les Exclusives range. Now, what Olivier Polge does with the Eau de Parfum is taking out the incense, which we had a lot in the Cologne and in the Eau de Toilette. You know, in my, uh, I got this one in 2009, the Pure Perfume of 22. In this one, I still sense incense. Sense incense. But not as much as in older batches of number 22 Pure Perfume. But it's still there. And this is when Jacques was, was still uh, um, the head perfumer for Chanel. But, so, Olivier tones number 22 down. And at first, when I first smelled his formulation of the Parfum, I was skeptical of it. I, I thought to myself, why is he depriving us of something that number 22 had and now doesn't have anymore, and yet... At the same time, Chanel is upping their price. They're cheaping out on us. And in a way they are, <laughs> because they've simplified it. I mean, they're selling it to us as a higher concentration, but the perfume itself is sim It's a different formula, you guys. The Eau de Parfum is a different formula. Now, I also do believe that Olivier Polge did not just invent the Eau de Parfum formula for 22 out of the blue. I am sure. I mean, you guys, this perfume exists since 1922. So I'm sure that somewhere down the line, whether it be Ernest Beau himself, or Henri Robert, or uh, Jacques Polge, one of them, I'm sure one of them already tackled with the concept of what if we were to release the Eau de Parfum? I'm sure the formula for the Eau de Parfum was in some drawer somewhere within the Chanel archives, perfume archives. So it's not like, I don't believe that Olivier, just out of the blue, had to reformulate um, number 22 into the Eau de Parfum concentration. I do believe that the formula for the Eau de Parfum concentration was already there. Because the way that I have smelled, that I have now become accustomed to smelling Olivier's Flankers, I know this is not a flanker, this is just a different concentration, but as I've seen what he does with flankers, what he did with Chanel Number no. 5 Low, uh, what he did with Coco Mademoiselle Intense, and then what he did with Coco Mademoiselle Privé, and what, he's do what he did just now this summer with Coco Mademoiselle Low, those are all flankers of Coco Mademoiselle. What he did um, with, what else did he do, flanker-wise? Well, with other things, what he did with other things is add other concentrations, like what he did with Eau Tendre, with his Eau de Parfum release. He softens, he rounds things up a little bit. He tries to make Chanel perfumes refract in the aldehydic top notes. He tries to make them refract the light less towards the blue-cold spectrum. He, he tends to kind of try to make those diamonds refract the light in a more warm spectrum. I think that's the trick that Olivier uses because he's known for warm fragrances. Actually, Oli one of my favorite perfumes from Olivier Polge is Diorum. And Diorum is famous for a, a warm spectrum, a warm nuance of light filtering through the fragrance. And it is divine to die for. I love Diorum to this day now renamed Dior Homme Original. I'm not talking about the shit that was released in 2020. Forget about that. That ain't good. That ain't good. <laughs> I'm talking about the original uh, Dior Homme uh, Eau de Toilette. So, when you know that, and then you analyze number 22 Eau de Parfum, you understand that in reality, what is going on here is a softening of a fragrance, making it more warm. But I have 
I began this review by telling you that number 22 was anyway the warmest and most giving of Chanel perfumes. So how can you make it even more giving? Well, you take away from it what made it more cool and austere. And the first thing you do is you strip it away of its incense. Because the incense gives you a churchy vibe. Frankincense gives you that austerity that uh, number 22 had in the base. Uh, now it's, it's, it's a warm vanilla in the base, right? I mean, there's vetiver there too, but it's like a very, very soothing, warm, even more warm than it used to be fragrance. And knowing how Olivier rounds things up, he always kind of etches away those hard edges off of the perfumes. In that respect, I respect number 22, the Eau de Parfum, because I understand what he's trying to do with it. He didn't need to. He didn't need to do it. He didn't need to soften something that was already wonderfully soft. But I have to say, there are days when I really crave the lack of incense in this one. There are those days when I want that just being just guided on a little fluffy cloud of, of sunshine that this perfume is uh, without any afterthought, without any need to go deeper. You know, of course, we always go deep with perfume, especially on my channel. You know, we go deep in the ana analysis of these fragrances and the psychological analysis of them as well. But, you know, you have your pure perfume for that of 22. You have your Eau de Toilette if you can. The pure perfume is still in production, so you can always buy that. You can hunt down the Eau de Toilette. You can hunt down the Cologne. The Cologne is even more deep and dark, um, as dark as 22 can get, because it never really gets that dark. But uh, so you could buy the pure perfume if you want more depth. The Eau de Parfum is for those days and those moments when you just want Chanel in your life, but you don't want that Chanel to be in any way, shape or form austere or cold. Then you go for number 22. And it's good that there's one fragrance in their entire assortment that actually delivers this feeling. Because why not? Why do all Chanel perfumes have to have that cold bitch touch to them? You know, they don't have to. So it's okay. Now, I would have preferred had Chanel kept the Eau de Toilette also in rotation. So we have a choice so that you could buy the pure perfume, Eau de Toilette or Eau de Parfum, whatever your preference is. Had I had the choice, still today, if all three were still in production, I would still keep purchasing all three, honestly. Because there are those days when I crave the Eau de Toilette, and then there are those days when I crave the Eau de Parfum, and then there are those nights when I crave the Pure Perfume. But, so, but this I want to say that it's okay for you to kind of, you know, because you might think, oh, I really miss the Eau de Toilette, I really miss that incense. It's okay to not have it. Uh, it's great if you get a chance to experience it, to smell it, to know what it is, but then move, moving on from that, there are those days when I really, really crave the warmth of this one. Now, you know, so if we compare it to the EDT, for example, right? So we had in the top notes, aldehydes in both, neroli in both, lily of the valley in both, and then uh, we got neroli in both, and, um, but there's like this more amped orange blossom in the Eau de Toilette, which is not really hyped as being a dominant opening note in the Eau de Parfum. So the Eau de Parfum is actually a little bit less floral in the opening and a little bit more aldehydic abstract. It's, it is. The Eau de Parfum smells more abstract than the Eau de Toilette. The Eau de Parfum is more of like a, a Chanelified abstraction of warmth while the Eau de Toilette is more of a Chanelified um, conceptualization of warmth. So to have a very conceptual aspect of warmth delivered through the Eau de Toilette means that you smell out the ingredients a bit more. In the Eau de Parfum, they mesh together a bit more, which is the downfall of many uh, Eau de Parfum Les Exclusives Chanel fragrances. It's that feeling that they give me that Olivier is not really good at blending ingredients very well. So where in the Eau de Toilette concentrations of many of these perfumes, Sycamore, for example, being one of them, you smell out and it cuts you like a knife. The vetiver in, in Sycamore is wet and the, you smell the soil and it's still dense and humid, like it's just been pulled out of the earth, that vetiver root. 
while the Eau Parfum version of Sycamore, it's like you've taken that root out, you've heated it up, it's warmed up, the soil all dried out, then you're mushing it up a little bit, you know, it's not, you don't identify the root anymore, then you spritz it with a little bit of powder scents, add a little bit more, you know, and then it's all kind of mixed, it's a mixed soup, and it doesn't do the perfume good. And Olivier went with his first reformulation or re- um, distribution of the fragrances in the Eau de Parfum concentration of the Les Exclusives, that's the biggest issue I have still to this day with 99, 98% of the Les Exclusives Eau de Parfums, that they're mushy. They're mushy, they're not clear, they're not crystalline anymore. And this is because I tell you, I have this feeling that he tends to, that Olivier tends to round up the edges. Every fragrance has to be bubbly in a certain way, has to have an alluring attractiveness. And this is why I don't think he's a perfect match for Chanel, ultimately. He's a great perfumer. He's done some amazing stuff outside of Chanel. But Chanel needs somebody with a cold heart. I know this sounds terrible, but that's the, the, the beauty and the aesthetic of Chanel. Chanel needs somebody who can manage cutting like with a knife the separation between every ingredient. And even though Chanel Number no. 5, you can't really smell out any ingredient in particular, that's the concept of that perfume. The genius behind it was that still it cuts you like a knife. That's even one step harder to do than maintaining every smell in particular and then having that every, every ingredient in particular smelling like it cuts you like a knife. It's one step further to make them all blend in together and still make it feel like it cuts you like a knife. Olivier can't do that. It's just not his thing. So he just takes all of the Les Exclusives, does the Eau de Parfums, and, and turns them into mush, into a mushy, more cocoony, warm vibe. And a lot of those perfumes just, you can't do that to them. Yeah, you just can't. Sycamore being the biggest example. Sycamore is a cold perfume. Now all of a sudden it's become a warm perfume, uh, re-released as an Eau de Parfum. Number 22 worked out fine because it was already from the get-go a warm fragrance so olivier could not mess it up too much you know what i mean still he toned it down made it even softer but that's okay because this one is already the most giving of chanel perfumes so do you understand where i'm going with this what i'm trying to say is i definitely recommend well don't blind purchase any expensive perfume anyway smell it first but i recommend this one highly of the les exclusives eau de parfums there's only three that i would really recommend to you of the ones that prior existed only as eau de toilettes because since 2016 all the new les exclusives fragrances that came out were released as eau de parfums so they never even existed in eau de toilette form not that we have smelled them so i'm not talking about uh boy which only came out as Eau de Parfum. I'm not talking about 1957, and I'm not talking about Le Lyon. I'm talking about all the other ones, right? That existed first and foremost as Eau de Toilettes. Um, so of those, I would recommend Gardenia in Eau de Parfum. Really, really delicious. Really delicious. I think softening it up helped Gardenia a lot. La Pausa, which is a totally different perfume. You know, it, they don't even call it 28 La Pausa anymore. So that's kind of debatable if that's a different concentration of 28 La Pausa. It smells very different, but love it. La Pausa, Gardenia, and number 22. Those are the three Eau de Parfums from the Les Exclusives range that today I recommend. Everything else, either buy the pure perfume if they have it, or hunt down the Eau de Toilette, or with the older, older ones, even Cologne's. Number 22 existed as a Cologne. I do prefer the Eau de Toilette to the Eau de Cologne, however. Now, the, the visualization of number 22 Eau de Parfum is very... It's very linear. Um, you spray it on, sunshine in a bottle. It's, it's like vanilla, rays of vanilla sunshine through aldehydes. And then... There's this masterful uh, tuberose and jasmine in there, and Ylang Ylang, I think, is in there as well, isn't it? Where's my... Oh, it's here. Um, yes, Ylang Ylang is there as well. Rose... You know, funny enough, the rose gets there towards the end. It kind of mixes with that vetiver. It's like a rose vetiver scent, which perhaps gives you a uh, visual of what incense could have been if it were still in this fragrance. Because if you blend rose and vetiver, sometimes it can smell incense-y. Um, but, so, 
It's a very linear trajectory. It's warm from the get-go, even though it's sparkly in the opening. It smells very sophisticated. It smells very much of the 20s. And it's so bizarre how, like no other, not even Chanel Number no. 5, because Chanel Number no. 5 is so timeless, it doesn't smell of the 20s to me. But nothing like Number 22 smells of the 20s. I don't know, because nothing today smells like this. And um, it still smells super modern. It still smells very avant-garde. It still smells extremely tantalizing and alluring and it doesn't make you feel like when you're wearing it like you're smelling something dated not at all when i say that it reminds me of the 20s it literally smells of the energy of the roaring 20s in particular what was going down in the roaring 20s in europe so you have the feeling that you're going out First of all, you're going to spend the afternoon in the cafes with all the intellectuals, the poets reading um, each other's poems, debating, discussing in the cafes, being super vocal about everything, but then, and drinking too, but then retreating back to your home to kind of get dressed for the night because you're going to a special premiere of a new theater piece and it's going to be an avant-garde theater piece with uh, screaming and singing involved. It's not, you know, things aren't very linear and yet the perfume is linear because it guides you through the day clearly it doesn't give up on you it doesn't let you down it's there for you in that respect it's linear even though your social interactions are all over the place the roaring 20s were all about investing all your love and energy and passion into projects and things and um, you always got double or triple the amount of energy or money back in whatever you invested in because there was so much this joie de vivre, you know, there was this like kind of everything is possible. Let's experiment. Let's do more. You know, the human body was also more free. There was also the concept of, you know, just being more naked and nude back then that we can't have today. I still ask myself why Instagram allows male nipples to be shown, but not female nipples. Like, you know, we have so many issues. We are we're, we're so messed up today, much more messed up in many respects than our society used to be back in the day. And so because I know that we're so messed up today, this one smells of a better time. Now, we, the Second World War was looming and glooming. You know, it wasn't just around the corner in 1922, but just 10 years from there, 1932, things were getting messy. So we got still 10 years of grandeur to live through in, in Europe while wearing number uh, 22 and, um, and feeling that opulence be between the two wars, obviously nobody still knew that a second world war was coming, but people in the higher echelons of society, they knew. They knew what was coming and they were preparing for it. So, but as a regular person that is into art and society and culture, enjoying life in the cafes, you might have been in the second half of the 20s wearing Queer de Russie because it had more of that Slavic, zesty Russian touch. But in the early 20s, number 22 was your transitional fragrance from the cafes, then transitioning to changing outfits at home and going out to, to a party, then you wear this, or even taking it out, you know, into the countryside for the weekend. You take number 22 into the countryside for the weekend, you don't take number five. You, you can, but number 22 is the one that laying... Okay, so this is how I envisioned this one. We're back in the life of Misia Sert, uh, Mizia being also a huge uh, patron of the arts and a big friend to Coco Chanel. I envision Mizia wearing this one while she's in her country house outside of Paris, laying down on that wonderful grass yard that she had. You know, the, she also, her one of the houses that she had at a certain point was really close to a little kind of river. So she would be in her boat, they would be on this little river next to the house, just spending, you know, lazy summer afternoons. You hear the crickets in the background. You have those like tall trees that are kind of hanging down. They cast a shadow onto you. The air isn't moving. It's that hot. You know, when you look into the distance, you almost see kind of like the air vibrating from the heat, the evaporation of the humidity from the soil or the grass into the air. And you have that kind of like slight shift you know, the, the, that shift of tint, tantalizing, tintillating, almost like a illusion 
of, of space melting and blending into one another, which probably also in many ways inspired Salvador Dali, who was also a friend of Mizia back then, uh, to create some of his, you know, dreamlike scenarios. A lot of his landscapes have this air that seems like it's like moving in the heat. So imagine laying, you know, you're in the backyard of Mizia's gorgeous mansion where she every weekend and sometimes even longer invited poets. Toulouse-Lautrec was a regular uh, friend, um, was a dear friend and a regular visitor at her home. And they would spend weekends together drinking, doing a lot of drugs too, but then just relaxing nonchalantly in the backyard, laying in the fields of grass with cashmere blankets laid down there, or just sitting in those kind of unclappable, uh, clappable wooden chairs with, with the striped a uh, gorgeous uh, cotton woven in a style very elegant, which was also used by Chanel later on. Coco could have come to visit as well, probably, probably, she did often. And then you would have famous, you know, Amizia would play the piano because she was really good at that, but she would also have other friends playing the piano. She would lean in on the piano. There are many portraits made by Toulouse-Lautrec of Amizia kind of leaning in on the piano, just listening to people playing that kind of lazy weekend scenario, you know, of the cultural intelligentsia or intelligentsia of the time, just, you know, reading poems, writing poems, painting. There would be uh, a, a paint. many painter friends of Mizia would come to visit her. A lot of them were in love with her too. And they would just paint her while she's just laying in the grass, relaxing, looking into the, the trees. And there's this kind of laziness about the beauty of just soaking in that nature that is really close to the central, to the main city, which was Paris, but at the same time, you're outside of the city and you're just enjoying that lazy countryside life and the sun in the summer with the crickets and the heat. And, you know, some one of the artists then says, oh, it's my turn to cook today. So, you know, they just pluck some plants that are in the garden. You're going to make some spaghetti. There's some good old French cheese also waiting for you that, you know, you're going to pick up from the neighboring uh, little cottage because the guy over there makes the cheese. So you got the handmade cheese for dinner. You know, the, the baker that you got the bread in the morning is like still fresh bread from that morning and you have that bread for dinner. There's a lot of wine, a lot of wine in the wine cellar. And you're just enjoying that cricket noise, glistening sun, lazy atmosphere, waving a little fan very slowly throughout the day, and just thinking about all the fun you're going to have that night when the party begins, because that's what artists do. They live in the night, and in the day they just ooze away while they wear number 22. That's exactly what this smells of. That's exactly what this smells of. And it is a wonderful visual. Every time I put on 22, I am literally catapulted back into us, into that sort of dream garden where all of these incredibly inspiring artists are all around me. They have so much, so many intelligent things to say, a lot of stupid things to say too, but that's the charm of it as well. There's a sense of humor, not taking yourselves too seriously, little flirtations happening between certain people, you know, little jealousies going, a little bit of drama happening as well. But at the end of the day, it's all fine because they all meet for that delicious dinner late in the night, you know, with kind of, it's so super hot. So your dress is kind of falling off the shoulder. You're acting out like a little coquette. Everybody's flirting. And then, you know, the drinking begins, the smoking begins, the drug begins, and then the night is just forever long. And you're just parting into the night until, because it is summer, so the sun rises really early on. So around four in the morning, it's already sunny outside. And then you just look at that sun rising and you think, wow, it's so beautiful. Ah, let's close the curtains. Let's make it still night for us. The night is still going to last forever. And these parties went on into the afternoon the next day, and then they would fall asleep and then wake up, you know, a lot went down back then, and 22 is a smell that accompanied that style of life. So when Chanel tries to sell you this perfume today as, oh, it's the, way, it's the best day of your life wedding fragrance, it's just because they want to play it safe and they don't want to tell you that, yeah, it is the best day of your life, but a wedding ain't the best day of your life. Spending a wonderful weekend in the countryside with your best friends and living that joy together, that's the best time of your life. And that's when you wear number 22.
that's when you wear number 22. And yes, especially in the Eau de Parfum concentration, because it's even more lighthearted and even more bubbly and even more this joie de vivre, this nonchalant, just laziness. Just, you know, when you also enjoy a particular cheese so much, that flavor, and you just, you know you shouldn't eat too much of it, but you indulge and you binge on that pleasure of that flavor. That's how you, you binge on 22. It, it gives you a pleasure for the flavor of life. That d delicious moment in time when you're spending hot summer days and nights with your best friends somewhere in the countryside. The escapism at its purest and best. Because there's no better escapism than the escapism of the 20s. You guys, there just isn't. The Roaring 20s Escapist Perfume, number 22. Even though in its 2016 concentration of Eau de Parfum, why not? Time travel with perfumes is totally normal for us. We're used to it by now. It's the word du jour. Time travel, darling, is the new black. I hope you've enjoyed my review of number 22 Eau de Parfum. Longevity, beast, projection, moderate. But I'm going to tell you, this one lasts for 12 hours on my skin. And the more, the older the bottle gets, the darker the juice gets, and the longer it lasts on the skin. So buy it. Let it age. Buy two bottles. Keep one open. Let it breathe. Let it age while you're using one. So by the time you're done with this one, the other one um, will, would have ripened. So when you start using the second one, buy the third one. You know, when this one is empty, you start using the one that, that is ripened. That's the time to buy a new bottle and let that one ripen. That's kind of my strategy with number 22 as well. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this review. And don't forget, next year... Now, I'm reviewing this perfume in 2021. But next year is the 100th birthday of number 22. And you best believe we're going to celebrate. We're going to celebrate like there's no tomorrow. We're going to celebrate number 22 next year. Number 22's 100th birthday. Just like I described it to you now. That visual of the weekend countryside crickets. And who knows? Maybe the lockdown will be over by then as well. Who knows? Maybe some other issue is going to happen in the world too. But wouldn't it be great to also do a meet and greet and just celebrate number 22 somewhere outside of Paris. Maybe some of y'all's has a villa or something that we could all go to and just like hang there for a weekend, enjoy life, barbecue together, cook a little something, something. Mm, that lazy life. I dream of that lazy life. And thanks to number 22, during the lockdown period, I have had the opportunity to live that life through the smell of this perfume. That's how strong perfumes are. All right. So what y'all's got to say about it? Let me read some of your chats. Jesus says, the Eau is also super long lasting. It is. I can attest to that. Um, CK says, that was like a perfect commercial for me. LOL. Velasquez says, let 2022 be the new roaring 20s. Let's just hope they don't end the same way like the old 20s ended. Miss Marie says, people used to love and appreciate their freedom and good times back then. Now it's all about safety and health. Now it's also all about the money and it's all about giving your life for a job, which is also sick. It shouldn't be that way. Uh, BJ Love says, I would love to have some uh, Torres black truffle crisps, but I'm not allowed them in the house. <laughs> Andamore says, have a wonderful evening, dear Deco. Thank you, Andamore, you too. Miss Marie says, dear Deco, would you give up on Chanel number no. 22 for a vintage joy by Jean Patou? Which one would you love more? No, I wouldn't give up on my 22. Never. Miss Marie says, if I am just a healthy, obedient slave is useless. Fr if I am just a healthy, obedient slave is useless. Friend, I don't understand the abbreviation. Oh, fact of stories, Yodo Toilette is a beast. Especially when it ages like this one. Check out how like dark it turned. Yeah, it's a beast. And um, incense with aldehydes turns it more into a beast. Um, Olivier rounded up really nicely. So it, it's, this one is, it keeps inviting. It just keeps, it's really, it's really delicious. And once you understand, once you understand the logic behind it, you can really get to appreciate it better, you know? And you could let go of the fact that it isn't the Eau de Toilette because it's not the Eau de Toilette. <laughs> um, uh, Mr. Philip Fabulous wants a chocolate cake now. Uh, Elodie says, I would love to try number 22, Pure Parfum. Have a small amount of Eau de Parfum. Still lovely though. Pure Perfume. It's, it's, it's more... It's colder. 
Okay, it's it's a cooler approach to it. It's not as warm as Eau de Parfum. Uh, the the pure perfume is. Um, it's like the pure perfume has hints of green in that yellow sunlight. You know, we have no green left in, uh, no green color left in the Eau de Parfum, but there's still green left in the pure perfume, if that makes any sense. Mrs. Blue, Jacob, you have transported me. I wish I was there. Thank you so much. I wish so too, Mrs. Blue. Oh. Daniel says, the 1920s was a golden age, but only if you had money and health. It was the pre-antibiotic era. Jerry Ryan says, I like pairing up my outfits with my fragrances, LOL. I like that too. I like that too. I do that sometimes. Mr. Philip Fabulous, uh, my, my, Jacob, you have sold me on this perfume. I do like incense though. Might prefer the other toilet. Or you could get the pure perfume because that one is still in production. That one, it, it has a bit of incense in it, I want to say. Even though, mm, not so sure. Again, mine is from 20, 2009. I haven't smelled the current pure perfume, so I don't know if they've reformulated it. So um, the last time I purchased the pure perfume of number 22 was in 2009. You know, that's quite a few years back. So I can't guarantee that the current formula smells the same. So you got to test it out for yourself and see if you could sniff out some incense in the current formula of number 22 uh, Parfum. Mm. Miss Marie, people in the 20s had more common sense than the people turning obedient sheep today. Oh, gotcha what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> Jerry says, love it when Jacob gets transported in time when describing a fragrance. He shines. I, I, I really escape my own body and I'm just like somewhere else. When, when the perfume takes me there, it takes me there, you guys. So I, I live. I live for that moment. Take me there now, says Drac. Let's all go. <laughs> Vijay Love says, I really like the Le Lyon and number five pure perfume, uh, but that's about it really. Please don't kick me out. No, why? We all are entitled to our own sense of smell and what we like or not like. Daniel in the Antipodes, uh, Nellie Melba mentioned the Edwardian clothes of her youth, which we thought were so beautiful, admitted that they were fussy compared to the clothes worn by the twenties when she wrote her memoir. Uh, Miss Marie says, Deco, which, oh, I already read that one. So, I mean, we have not lived in the 20s. We can only romanticize about them. And, but these perfumes already existed in the 20s. These perfumes were not uncomfortable. Unlike some of the clothes, these perfumes were not uncomfortable. Coco exploded on the fashion market in the 20s using very comfortable jerseys, silks, and cashmeres to dress people without corsets. So, a lot of the clothes in the 20s started becoming also much more comfortable to wear. It's not all as bad as some people portray it to be. It ain't all as good either, obviously. Same applies to the times we live in today. I'm sure some people are living the time of their lives, even during lockdown, with riches and fortune and whatever, and then you got people starving to death. So put things in perspective. We are romanticizing an era through the smell of a perfume because that's all we got left. We have photo. Well, back then they started doing photos with more paintings. We have um, memoirs. We have portrayals through, through, through paper documents in print form. But what we really only have is perfumes. We have the music, the composition of the music from back then. We have the paintings still, obviously. But it's a very romantic vision. Only artistry, only the art remains. So, so what do we have to go by? In another 50 to 100 years, when we look back to 2021, we're only going to have really shitty art to look at because most art is really crap. The famous artists of today are crap. They're not going to move you. They're not going to be romantic at all. What are you going to have? Your Jeff Koontz blow up balloon dog as a symbology of, of our era? Wow, what a moving piece of art. You know what I mean? Um, different times. Different, different times. So the romantic romanticizing about the 20s you don't need to of course i know a lot of you know your history a lot of you know exactly how difficult it was to live back then but this is not what this video is about this video is not about ignoring the fact that it was also hard for a lot of people back then this video is about delivering a dream and even those who could afford and maybe some people were collecting saving up money to buy number 22 back then by buying number 22 even back then 
and smelling it. Maybe you couldn't afford to spend the whole weekend with your friends in a villa out in the countryside outside of Paris, but you could smell it. You could smell the dream of it. And we still have that dream today through that smell of this perfume. And that's the magic of perfume. So we don't need to even touch base on, oh, but it was really bad for a lot of other people. Yeah, it's the same shit all the time, still today. You're going to talk about a couple, of, a handful of people living their life and everybody else is, is suffering. I mean, that's, that's how life is. So, but I want to forget about the pain. I want to forget about the struggles when I smell a perfume. When I smell a perfume, I just want to, I just want it to, to transport, if it's a perfume I love, obviously. I just want that perfume to transport me to a place where I can dream where I can be in my bubble, where that dream makes me feel safe. And in order for me to feel safe, I can't envision myself struggling, not having enough clothes, not being able to take a train and all that to, to go to the countryside. You know, I want to forget about that. It's, it's just like when you go to the movies today, you want to go to the movies to forget about yourself for two hours while you're looking at that movie. That's at least what I like to do. Uh, same applies to perfume. When I apply perfume, it's better than a movie because it lasts longer. Well, some perfumes are super slow, like low quality. After two hours, you don't smell them anymore. So they're like the length of a movie. But perfumes like number 22 that last me 12 hours on my skin, that's worth more than a ticket to go to see a two-hour movie. Uh, because when I spray on number 22, the movie in my head, every time I smell it, plays on for 12 hours. And I live in my bubble. And I love, as dangerous as this escapism is, I love that escapism. Uh, Mr. Philip Fowler says, the myth of the suffocating corsets. In reality, a corset is a supporting garment. Not wearing a corset would be scandalous. Having your um, breasts uh, dangling around, scandalous, darling. Jerry Ryan says, I just have no idea what I'd wear with Le Lyon. That's up to you. Use your imagination. <laughs> um... Lord says, oh, this perfume sounds nice. Those were the days, says Lila, LOL. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, thumb it up and let me know what your thoughts are on Chanel number 22, the Eau de Parfum, or for that matter, any other concentration in the comment section down below. Uh, and subscribe to my video, uh, to my video, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Um, you can also push the join button next to the subscription button and become a member today, gain access to extra perks, such as being listed as the co-producer of the Fashion Bunker at the end of every video, like you see here. Scrolling at the end of every video. Same applies to all my patrons. who Join me on Patreon, Super Deco Ball spelled together. Gain access to extra perks, including exclusive videos that only come to Patreon and don't come to YouTube. So. Uh, there's that. You can also follow me on my Instagram and other social media platforms, Super Decable spelled together on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. But you can also follow me on my two Chanel dedicated Instagram profiles. One is called Coco Chanel is in my house, dedicated to Coco Chanel and my Chanel collection, everything that the brand is up to these days. And then the other profile is called Coco Chanel Privé, all spelled together, dedicated to the life of Coco Chanel. So there's that. Let me see if I can get any more of your comments in. Jerry Ryan says, they missed the dirty note that Cuit de Russie de Toilette had, rather. Uh, in the new version of Cuit de Russie, yeah, they're missing that dirty touch. But again, they're missing also the cold touch. Jesus says, if is as if perfumes should have nuclear longevity and projection. No, they don't have to, but this one does. Lord says, I agree with Deco. For the most part, the pure parfums are the way to go. If you're lucky enough to get your hands on them, pure perfume is amazing. And it stays closer to the skin. It doesn't project as much. Also, because you're not spraying it out. Well, I do because I've decanted mine. But uh, you're dabbing it on. So it's a totally different experience. Miss Marie says, Deco, would you give... I oh, read that one already. Uh, twice, actually. <laughs> so... Um... Uh-huh. Jesus says, that's exactly why Chanel discontinued Eau Toilettes and replaced them with Eau Parfums because people were constantly complaining about longevity. Okay, I see what you mean, Emilia. So you meant like as if perfumes need to have long longevity. I think Chanel is kind of lying to us here, allegedly, I have to say. Uh, they've only discontinued Eau Toilettes and put Eau de Parfums because in 2016, Louis Vuitton launched their own exclusives range. They were all Eau de Parfums with a higher price range. So Chanel was like... <clears throat> 
shit, we can't just up overnight $100 more for the Eau de Toilettes. So let's do something shrewd. Let's discontinue the Eau de Toilettes, bring the Eau de Parfum so we can charge more for them and up the price drastically. And then we're more at the same level as Louis Vuitton priced fragrances. And we can just tell people that uh, the perfumes weren't, uh, the longevity wasn't good enough. I have the first formulations of the first release Les Exclusives from 27. And uh, they were beast mode. Then with the years, Chanel watered them down more and more and more. So I'm like, your other toilets can be really strong. It's just that you water them down to save more money, to earn, to make more profits. And then you're making it sound like we were complaining that they were too watered down. So now you're giving us your parfums. Listen, there's a lot of shady business that happened down there. Just saying. All right, you guys, until next time, never forget to never give up on love. See you all soon. Take care. Bye.